How's it going? Juan Das here, and welcome back to the lesson video for this week. Sorry I missed last week, but was just prepping a lot with a new single. Speaking of which, a huge thank you to everyone that's checked it out. Really means an absolute ton. I received a lot of really lovely messages, and it really means the absolute world to uh, see that everyone's enjoying it. If you haven't checked it out, please do go. So, uh, please do so right here. I'm just going to put a link up in the cards. So today, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about comping, and talk specifically about five things that can improve your comping. And it's something I usually tend to see a lot with students that come in, and these are kind of um, points that I usually end up suggesting, uh, suggesting to a wide variety of students. I can't speak today. I think I might need another coffee. Suggesting to a wide variety of students to really handle and uh, consider in their practice. And they're more so mindset things. I've done a couple of videos and I will link them throughout if I find them relevant to what I'm talking about, but this is just kind of a quick overview of five things you can do to improve your comping. So let's get started with point number one. I'm going to dive in because I want to spend a little bit of time on each one and I don't want the video to get too long. So point one is time and time feel. I think that's a self-evident point. If you want to be a good accompanist for somebody or even for yourself, you need good and solid time. Because what happens is if you start, if your time starts wavering a little bit, the other person is gonna feel quite uncomfortable or maybe the band has to pick up some of your slack and mark the time a little more steadily. Ultimately, when I'm playing on the bandstand, I want to be pretty free. I wanna feel like I can go in any direction. I wanna feel like I have some control, um, and one of those things that I don't particularly like is when I have to pick up someone's slack. And more often than not, I'd say that if I feel kind of bad after a gig, you know, it happens to all of us, we get off a gig and think, ah, oh, that didn't go so well. It's usually because I, my time feel was weird, or my form was off, or I lost the form somewhere. So. Please note, those are the two cardinal sins, I guess, and I'll get to that in a bit. But let's talk about the time feel thing and that you really want a solid time feel. And how can this be remedied? Put yourself in situations where you have to be responsible for the time. And you can do this really in one of two ways, either by playing with people or playing in um, a situation like something with a metronome, not Put, giving you all the harmonic, sorry, all the metric information that you need. So for example, a metronome with the click on just four or just two. Um, if you're new to this, two and four for swing, just to get yourself feeling kind of comfortable and establishing some independence in yourself. If you want to go the route of playing with other people, I mean, yes, the obvious thing is to play with good drummers and to play with a great rhythm section, but nothing really exposes you more than playing duo. I found. Uh, this was actually a recommendation from a teacher of mine a long time ago, and he mentioned play duo with uh, situations where you are responsible for the time. That means playing with other guitar players, a horn player, a singer, or some sort of melodic instrument, um, where you have to really find yourself. I'm just using Stella as an example. Mm. Really just outlining the form and keeping the time. And try be honest with yourself. And if you find yourself doing this with duo, you'll notice very quickly where your time feel is a little shaky. So moving on to the next point, point number two, one other thing that could help improve, and I did a video on this a while ago on uh, why you might be losing the form is exactly that, the form. 
you might actually not know the tune as well as you think. And the key is really having a solid understanding of the form of any tune and familiarize yourself with, you know, A, B, A forms, standard 32 bar forms, a blues, what's a rhythm changes. Or if you're playing an original composition, you have to comp for, excuse me, the comp for somebody's solo. Familiarize yourself with the form of that tune or the harmonic movement. So for example, if I'm playing Stella, I, what is the form for that tune? It's kind of like an A, B, C, A form, basically. So understanding that it's also a 32 bar, you know, that really helps me set up certain sections to make it easier for the soloist. At the end of the day, you know, you are accompanying somebody else. And sometimes, you know, depending on where they're at, they might need, you can be really free and you can kind of allude to the form, or they might need a little more guidance and you have to mark the form a little more clearly. But if you as an accompanist aren't really marking the form and aren't aware of it, that's a danger for the whole ensemble, not just you and not just for the soloist. So really be aware of the melody, really be aware of the harmony, the structure, if there is a structure, like a very clearly defined structure. Um, you know, get comfortable. You know, I'm, there's no guesswork involved. You can hear that's a blues. And oftentimes, one of the signs I've seen of someone that's a really good comper, I can hear them comp and just from the changes, I know the tune. Everything is very clear. I know what song they're playing. So that's point number two. I'd say the next point kind of closes out the most important of these five points. The first three are the most crucial. The last two are kind of little bonus things that you want to think about. And the, la the last of the three points is context. Context meaning what size group are you playing with? Because that's going to really determine uh, your voicing choices, how busy you are, if you're going to play busy, maybe how big uh, or small of a space you take up in the ensemble, things like that. So if you're play playing solo, for example, you kind of want the form to be quite clear unless you're going for a deliberately abstract thing. If you're playing duo, you want to take over some of that uh, lower frequency information because you, chances are you might not have a bass player unless you're playing duo with a bassist and he's covering, he or she's covering you, you know? But when it comes to playing a tune, and let's say I'm playing a duo thing with a singer or somebody else, I'm not going to pick very delicate voicings or, you know, I'm not going to play very tiny voicings unless I want it to create an intimate atmosphere, right? But most of the time I'm going to be playing... I'm going to be trying to make up for the fact that there isn't really a bass voice somewhere in the ensemble. The points where I think guitar players might have more freedom, sure, this is a video for everyone, but I'm speaking specifically from a guitaristic lens for this one. Um, trio and quartet without a piano, as in quartet with maybe a horn or some other melodic instrument, those tend to be the places where the guitar player has the most freedom because now they've got a bassist covering the lower register, there's more freedom for substitutions and things like that. They can interact a little more. They're not kind of marking the form so much. Um, and, you know, you can experiment with your textures. But the minute a piano player gets involved, you know, that's going to change your entire thing. And if you're playing in a big band, you know, you're not aiming for these huge voicings unless they're written in or somebody wants you to play that. So understanding your context is imperative because it's going to help you fit. It's going to help you fit and understand what is my role, how can I best suit the music, and how can I best highlight. Remember, um, being an accompanist requires a certain level of humility in the sense that it's not your show, 
even if you are playing chords, you're not outshining the soloist, you're supporting the soloist or the melody and making sure that speaks. So the last two points, I'm just going to run through these kind of quickly, are little mindset things that you can use to kind of get some bonus stuff and maybe, let's say if you're already a solid comper but you're looking for something more interesting, this might be of use for you. So the first thing, please do not be a backing track. I'm going to make a really crude joke here and say if I wanted a backing track or I wanted a lifeless backing, I'd just play to iReal Pro. And that's not something anyone really wants to hear, you know? And at the end of the day, we are musicians. We are live musicians who play the instruments. You're not just there providing a static backing. Interact with the soloist, you know? Interact with your band. Interact, use dynamics in your solos. You know, play with different textures. For example, I can play Stella with just... That's a sound. Or I can use maybe melody. I can actually use melody or little dyad ideas to kind of get an interactive feel, you know? And then back to supporting roll. Dyad. You know, make your comping exciting. Now that doesn't mean overtake the band, but play with the band. Don't just kind of get stuck in your role of, okay, I have to comp because, again, now this list is compiled of things I've learned over the years or things I've learned as a soloist that I want from a comper. And one of my little pet peeves of sorts is when I'm trying to propose a direction or want the comping to go somewhere else and, you know, the comper is just kind of stuck in their own world. Play with the band. Do not be a backing track. Don't just default to voicings. Explore. Play. Play with textures. Play with dynamics. Play with register, you know? Especially if you're playing duo, you have a lot of freedom for that. And lastly, this actually leads me to my last point, which is listen to the soloist. And it's very similar to um, some of the other points I've mentioned, specifically, you know, don't be a backing track, but rather listen to the soloist for the cue on how to play. For example, if the soloist is very clear with their harmony and they're marking the form and you can hear the changes, you actually might not need to comp as deliberately. You can actually be quite sparse. You know, you can comp quite sparsely, or you can just kind of play around a little more. Sometimes, you know, you can even lay out but then if they're starting to stretch a little more and it kind of needs that foundation, play some stuff underneath it to give a foundation. If the soloist is going loud, you know, or starting to really push their intensity, follow that. Follow the intensity. I mean, try without getting in their way. Or if the soloist is suddenly starting to pull back, see what happens when you pull back and you play a little more sparsely. You know? If the soloist is playing maybe quite high and low, you know, very contrapuntally, you can kind of squeeze in a little of those moments. I mean, obviously, try not to mimic the soloist. That's a different story altogether. Be an accompanist and support them. You don't have to catch every piece of information. I mean, that's a whole different story and probably another video we could talk about. But make a commentary on what they're playing. So really listen to the soloist for your cues because that's where you're going to get a lot of your instructions for direction, even if they're not overt and explicit. They're going to be very implicit. You can just listen to their phrasing and see where they goes, uh, where the phrasing goes. Or if the soloist is struggling and maybe, you know, 
can't find a section, they might have lost the form themselves. If you're aware of the form, like we said before, and you've heard that they're struggling, mark the form a little more clearly until they've caught on, and then you can go back to maybe taking a more flexible role. So, I hope this video was really helpful for you guys, and maybe give, gave you a few solutions to kind of fix up your comping, or kind of plug in a few holes that uh, you might have overlooked at some point or the other. If you'd like, uh, on my Patreon, instead of, um, I did this two weeks ago or a week ago, just because I felt bad for missing a week, but this is taking the week, uh, the place of this week's extended lesson. I've got a whole PDF document with these points and maybe just, uh, expanded a little bit on what I've talked about in this video on ways you can practice this, things to think about, and I think it's a nice tool to have in your practice session or something to refer to every now and then so you don't have to keep coming back to this video. Um, but do check that out on the Patreon. I've also got a bunch of extended lessons up there, listening lists, things like that. I'd really appreciate it. And if you want to dive a little deeper, that's what that space is for. So thank you once again for checking out the video and I will see you in next week's lesson. Take care, guys.